This is the American Law Journal. You're a couple living together outside of traditional marriage, gay or straight, young or old. What are your rights in the eyes of the law? Welcome to the program. I'm Christopher Naughton. Tonight on the American Law Journal, marriage by any other name, unmarried couples and the law. Let's meet my three lawyer guests. Yvette Alvarez joins us tonight from Einhorn Harris, one of the largest, if not the largest, family law practice in the state of New Jersey. Professor John Culhane is with us tonight, and he's with Widener University School of Law, and our returning champion is Donald Spry, at 20 years running, and from King Spry. And Don, the, the reason I actually do raise that is let's go, let's go to the videotape and go back about 10 or 12 years ago, and I want your comments on it. But most people know that when it comes to full faith and credit in this country, if you're married in one state, another state must recognize the validity of that marriage. So when Hawaii started clamoring, oh, we're going to accept gay marriages, I think Utah was the first one on the boat that said, no, 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 we don't care what other states do. That we're not going to accord full faith and credit. Is this what Pennsylvania did, Don? This is a preemptive strike? Yeah, I think. I think clearly um, in every other situation the general rule is that states will give full faith and credit to other states judgments or orders uh, except now for same-sex marriages and Congress there's a federal law Defense of Marriage Act which um, says that states can define marriage and do not have to give full faith and credit. How old is that? Now again, looking at what you, you said uh, in the, back in the 1990s, Pennsylvania does not sanction gay marriage, but the state of New, New Jersey does acknowledge and sanction civil unions. The state of New York has now approved, if you will, has uh, passed uh, by way of law and statute that gay marriages are legal. Uh, Pennsylvania may not be that far behind. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but your neighbors have already taken that step. Well, it, it's hard to say. That would be a legislative response. Uh, Pennsylvania's dealt with gay marriage issues in uh, adoption, custody, support, and actually has been, uh, I think commentators have viewed it as rather progressive on case law. But as long as the Defense of Marriage Act is statutory in Pennsylvania, um, it's going to uh, prohibit a state from recognizing gay marriage. So, Professor Colhane, uh, Pennsylvania has not amended their constitution as many states across the Union have, but their law is in place. Marriage, as defined by the Defense of Marriage Act, is between a man and a woman. That's right, but, but there are uh, at least a couple of things to keep in mind here. The first is that even though Pennsylvania has a law prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying, there is nothing that would prohibit the Pennsylvania legislature from passing a civil union law. And in fact, that's what's happened in places like Nevada, where there was a law against, in fact, in that state, a constitutional amendment against uh, same-sex marriages. But the legislature just went ahead and passed uh, what's basically a civil union law there mm -hmm. uh, by a different name. The second thing to keep in mind is that since it's a state law and not a state constitutional amendment, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court could say that under the Pennsylvania Constitution, the state law is unconstitutional. So even if the legislature doesn't repeal the law, mm -hmm. there are a couple of uh, mechanisms that are available to bring at least some of the rights of marriage to same-sex couples. A civil union, which is marriage without the name, or full marriage if the court got involved and issued a progressive decision. And that's, isn't that exactly what happened, uh, uh, Yvette, in, in the state of New Jersey? I mean, uh, it didn't look like there was going to be that kind of acceptance. And then all of a sudden, it, it seemed like the house of cards fell pretty quickly. Well, uh, precisely. We, we had a domestic partnership statute. And uh, then Lewis versus Harris case came around. And um, it, the Supreme Court of New Jersey said, uh, you are not giving equal rights to um, same-sex couples by giving them domestic partnership. You have 180 days to correct this. I see. And, Told um, the legislature. Absolutely. Okay. And that's when the civil union um, statute came about. But right. keep in mind, if I may, that the, sure. that the uh, court gave the legislature the option. They could either that's correct. pass something like a civil union law, which they did, uh, or they could have passed full marriage equality, and the legislature took what's the politically easier uh, solution, which was to pass the civil union law, which still exists uh, today, even though there's a lot of push in New Jersey for full marriage equality. You're absolutely correct. You know, Don, you said just a few moments ago that even though, again, Pennsylvania doesn't acknowledge gay marriage, and, and some would say that in some ways, Pennsylvania has lagged behind other states when it's come to domestic relations. When it comes to acknowledging rights, uh, joint custody rights uh, mm -hmm. of uh, 
of lesbian and, and gay individuals. Uh, they took a huge step, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania took a huge step just last year, where they overruled 25 years of, uh, of precedence. This court has moved to 2010, and I think one person called it overturning the Dred Scott decision of Pennsylvania, where today, if you're a gay, a gay individual, you're not going to face the kind of rigors of getting equal joint custody rights. No, you're right. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has said that, that the focus is on the best interest of the child, and um, you're not going to have any sort of a burden to overcome if, if you're gay. Um, and I, I think, you know, I've been involved in, in cases uh, in gay arrangements where there's a, a custody issue, and Trying the case is similar to trying any other custody mm -hmm. case. I mean, mm -hmm. the court focuses on what's in the best interest of the kids, and I, I think they have um, what, what some commentators have viewed as a, as a progressive view, mm -hmm. both in custody, uh, second parent adoptions, and child support. Professor Colhane, uh, t tell me if, if maybe I'm just reading this wrong, but it appeared to me that years ago, that when uh, custody issues and visitation issues and adoption issues came up, regarding gay couples. There didn't seem to be a whole lot of resistance uh, across the board. And then when uh, members of our society started to, to promote the notion that perhaps gay folks should enjoy the same marital rights, it almost seemed as though a number of states, I'm thinking of Louisiana in particular, almost had this, this response, this recoil, to start limiting the rights of some gay couples from adopting, uh, infringing on some of their rights dealing with visitation and custody. Is that my imagination or is there some truth to that? There is some truth to it and one of the things that you're really touching on is to me one of the most fascinating aspects of all of this which is for years uh, gay couples and single gay and lesbian people were able to adopt uh, children and, and it wasn't much uh, contested. You might run into a particular judge who would give you a hard time, but unless there was a statute in a particular state like Florida that uh, uh, said that gay and lesbian people were uh, basically not fit to adopt, in most other states it was not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And what I always found interesting about that is you would let uh, gay couples and lesbian couples adopt children but then not allow them to marry which seems strange because then the parents are legal strangers to each other and I think the move toward marriage equality has sort of gotten people thinking about you know whether it's a good idea to allow uh, gay and lesbian people and couples to adopt but really there aren't many examples there's Louisiana they tried this in Arkansas but the Arkansas Supreme Court uh, threw this out an attempt to uh, restrict the rights of gay and lesbian people to adopt. So there really have been only a very few examples of this. It's not your imagination, but this idea that these constitutional amendments against uh, marriage equality would then spread to adoption really haven't borne out as much as people thought they might. And I think part of that is that these kids need homes in the adoption context. And in the custody context, you know, judges look at the kid and look at the relationships of the parents and are inclined to make uh, practical decisions that really are not sort of a product of ideology about, about gay and lesbian couples as much as these constitutional amendments you know, tend to be. Where are we in the country today? I, I think there are what, uh, Yvette, uh, six states in the nation today that accept gay marriage as the law of their state. I believe, I believe it's eight. And then there are two, that are, New Jersey being one of them, uh, that, uh, that has approved civil unions. I believe it's eight. All right, and then there are 28 states, and Professor, you'll correct us if we're wrong here, but I think there are 28 states that have already either amended their constitution or have adopted the Defense of Marriage Act. Act. Right. All right. That's right. So we. So basically, more than that, actually. But, more than but, that. Okay. All right. So, but we're talking about approximately 40 states that have committed themselves one way or the other. Now, there are still some states that are that are straddling the fence. Don't they? Uh, don't they expose themselves to some of the biggest problems legally, Don Spry? Because all of a sudden now, if someone gets married in New York State, a gay couple, and they come to a state, and again, I don't know uh, any of them offhand, that haven't committed themselves one way or the other, isn't that state bound, under full faith and credit, to accept the marriage of the state of New York or Vermont or Massachusetts? Unless, of course, they've changed their own laws. Well, I, I think so. I mean, arguably, the federal... Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional as a violation of full faith and credit. I don't know, that, and the professor may know this, I don't know if that issue has been raised, um, but I, I think it's a, 
a huge problem, uh, this lack of full faith and credit. Um, even uh, the states that have passed defensive marriage acts. It's a huge, it's a huge logistical nightmare, if I can just uh, jump in. I mean, I was thinking about this and, you know, thinking about when I go to my parents' house and I have to look, you know, for different cable channels because, because the, the numbers are different, you know. I mean, imagine a silly example like that and then multiply it over the entire life of a couple, right? So you're married in one state and then you cross the line and now you're civilly united at best in another state because civil union is the maximum recognition in that state. And then you go to Texas or Oklahoma and you've got no recognition at all and you can't dissolve your marriage. And then you go to New Mexico, which is a state that has no law on the issue either way. You know, what does that state have to say if you want to, uh, you know, dissolve your uh, union? So it really is an untenable situation in the long run, I think, uh, to have this sort of balkanized system where people's marriages sort of come and go depending on what state they're in. Uh, really is not sustainable. Um, and I think it's going to force the hand of the Supreme Court, don't you think, Professor? I think so. I think so. Although, uh, uh, let's be clear, the, the challenge that's uh, basically likely to come to the Supreme Court is not based on the full faith and credit piece um, of DOMA. It's based on the other piece of the uh, Defense of Marriage Act, which is the piece that says uh, even if you have a valid marriage in your state, let's say Massachusetts, that marriage counts for nothing in a federal context. So you can't file joint income taxes, you can't sponsor a spouse in, uh, for immigration law, you know, no death benefits under Social Security, and on and on and on. But full faith and credit really is the cornerstone of the domestic relations system. If that is broken down, how do lawyers practice? How do people travel from one state to another and know what their rights are? I defer to my practicing colleagues here. I think it's an extremely difficult. It's, it's very difficult. You cannot, you need to know so, you, you need a crystal ball to know what's going to happen to this couple. And that's true with any, you know, marriage, in any marriage situation. But in this case, because of the patchwork quilt of our country and in terms of the law and the federal law, layered on top of that, it's very difficult to even begin to address and, and counsel people on those. You can, you can, oh yeah, you can imagine in Pennsylvania, we don't have a civil union, we, we don't have um, a, a, marriage a gay marriage statute, so when someone wants to dissolve a relationship here, it's the law of cohabitation, uh, which has been in effect for years, but when you try to settle something, you know, traditional divorce case, you might do alimony and you can deduct it and that kind of thing, or you transfer uh, pension Property. assets and it's a tax-free transfer. You don't have those federal protections, even in New Jersey or any other state that has a civil union. Well, to address that very issue, when we come back, what happens when a female lawyer marries another woman, but when she dies, her parents contest the legitimacy of that union? More when we return here on the American Law Journal. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by King Spry, serving its Pennsylvania clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law for over 30 years. Einhorn Harris, a long-standing community law firm with the largest family law practice in New Jersey. And The Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers. This is the Workers' Compensation Minute with Martin Banks. Many people don't realize that they may be eligible for Social Security disability benefits in addition to workers' compensation benefits. Here are a few things that you need to know. First, if you're an injured worker 50 years and older and have been out of work for more than a year, you have an excellent chance of getting Social Security disability benefits in addition to workers' compensation. Second, after two years of Social Security disability benefits, you become eligible for Medicare, meaning you're covered for any medical problem that isn't work-related. Third, when you have workers' compensation and Social Security disability benefits, there may be what's called an offset. An offset is when you may not get all the benefit amounts of both. But stay with me here. Even though your Social Security could be less because of your workers' compensation award, there's a good chance that you could receive more 
if you file for both. There are many factors that go into determining your benefits. Speak to an attorney who is experienced in both workers' compensation and Social Security disability because some lawyers don't consider both. It could add up to thousands of dollars a year. For the Workers' Compensation Minute, I'm Halman Banks. The Workers' Compensation Minute has been made possible by Martin Banks. Marriage by any other name, unmarried couples and the law. Three guests with me on the set tonight. Yvette Alvarez hails from Einhorn Harris, uh, one of the largest family law practices in the state of New Jersey. Professor John Culhane hails from Widener University School of Law, and he's written extensively on this topic. And Donald Spry is with King Spry, Herman Freund and Fall in Pennsylvania, and much like Yvette's uh, firm has taken cases to the highest courts in their respective states. Uh, Professor Colhane, a really interesting case that has come out of Pennsylvania and actually involves a law firm, and it involves a woman who was married to another woman in Canada, and when she passed away, Let's face it, all hell broke loose. Tell us a little bit about this right, right, right. Tobit's case. Well, you know, it's one of those cases that uh, is probably being replicated somewhere even as we speak. And it's what happens when you have a marriage recognized in some places and not in other places. So what happens in this case is the couple's married. There's a, uh, a, a beneficiary form uh, for benefits that either is or isn't signed. There's a lot of facts uh, sort of in dispute here. By the woman who was an employee uh, at the law firm. And purportedly, she signed this, giving these benefits to her parents. Um, but there was some indication, or at least the uh, a partner claims, the, the surviving partner of this woman who is now dead, uh, claims that, that the couple was told that they would be considered spouses under the terms of the plan. And if they were spouses, the argument is, that they would supersede any rights of the parents. Now, there's all kinds of factual confusions in this case that I don't fully understand. Primarily, or, or I guess uh, first among them, is whether uh, the uh, now deceased woman actually signed the document. It's not clear she did, and if she did, whether she named her parents as beneficiaries. But, but in irris any, yeah. irrespective of that, though, yeah. I mean, there's, there's still something very compelling here because I, basically we're talking about uh, the proceeds, uh, the, the benefits of a retirement plan. That's right. An investment plan. And let's face it, under the law, if you're married, you basically, you know, can't sign away uh, the rights and benefits of your spouse. That's right. So, so the problem here is, you know, was she the spouse? And the surviving partner is arguing that, in fact, the firm had told him that she would be considered the spouse. And now it looks like it's less than clear if you look at the documents. And it, it really shows, I think, the importance of not only uh, uh, making sure that you fill out all your documents the way you want them to be, but also, you know, to sort of be uh, proactive with your employer and basically tell them, you know, this is what I intend, let's make sure this happens. Because, you know, uh, people will do things uh, when family members die that sometimes, unfortunately, brings out their worst instincts. Right, and that's and then part of and part of what is fascinating about this case is that these two women, expecting that they are completely married under the law, that they are indeed legally married under the law, uh, one woman purportedly, uh, the attorney who died, the night before she dies, she signs off on some paper that says the, the beneficiaries of this investment plan are her parents. Right, and there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole question here. One, did she sign it? And two, if she did, was she really in any mental condition to have signed it the very eve of her death? But let's get beyond that for just a yeah. minute, Professor Colhane. And, and here's my question. If this is a heterosexual marriage, is there going to be a, a problem here? No, or none of this applies. If it's a heterosexual marriage and if the rule is that you can't sign away your, uh, the, the benefits of your spouse, then if your spouse has first rights, then you know, none of this arises. So it's only because there's this question about whether their spouses, you know, whether their legal relationship is going to be recognized for the purposes of this plan that this becomes an issue. And it really just illustrates once again how confusing and complex these issues are for same-sex couples um, 
who really had better go out and do, you know, living wills and powers of attorney and make sure all their beneficiary forms are, you know, going to their spouses if that's what they want. Right. Unwed couples of, of all types. We'll get that's, to that in a, in that's a, right. in a moment. Right. But Yvette, you were going to say. I was going to say that's the issue in New Jersey. We have civil unions, but when civil unions was, were created, um, the um, same-sex couples say we do not have the same rights of married people. And that's just one of the examples, that they do not have the same rights of married people even now. I think the, yeah, I think the other thing, and the facts are garbled in this yes, case, I think we good. all think they are, but, but if, if the deceased lawyer had done all of those things, if, if this was a federal plan, if the deceased lawyer had filled out all those forms trying to leave everything to her partner, she probably wouldn't have been able to do it because she's not a spouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, the professor's right. Um, if, if it were a heterosexual um, mm -hmm. arrangement, um, there's no question that there'd be a spouse. And uh, the, o the only way that, that that property could go to her parents, the deceased lawyer's parents, would be if the spouse signed off. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, at least if that had been the case, then, Professor, the, the parties might have been talking settlement, but apparently this, is, this has gone past settlement. It seems that way. All right. We're going we're to con obviously continue to watch that case, a, a really compelling case. What's going down today in family law when we talk about the rights, the respective rights of an unwed couple, and maybe they're gay, but maybe they're straight? How are unwed couples starting to intersect with your practices today? Much more so than before. Um, I, I was commenting just recently that I'm getting a lot of child support um, cases between unmarried couples, and uh, much more so than before. Mm -hmm. And uh, do they get the same treatment in, in the courts? Well, in New Jersey, we have the FM docket, which is the divorce docket, mm -hmm. and then we have the family, the FD docket, which is the non-married. Um, I, for one, always tell my clients that I want them to be in the FM docket because it's, it's a much more precise um, look at the issues. But, you know, unfortunately, that's the way New Jersey does it. Mm -hmm. What about you, Don? Well, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, you know, more and more people that live together. And if, if people are getting married, we tell them to sign prenuptial agreements. If people are going to live together and they have assets, we tell them to sign what we call cohabitation agreements. Okay. And that just lays out what will happen if there's a dissolution of that arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, Pennsylvania, there, there's a lot of case law in Pennsylvania that basically uh, talks in terms of enforcing contracts. And this is the you know, Lee Marvin, Michelle Triola in, in, in California. Palimony cases. Palimony. Mm -hmm. we, we have it here. And it, it, it re what it really is, is um, if you can prove that I said to the person I'm living with, I will take, you know, you stop working and I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. And the judge believes that. And that's an oral contract. That's basically what palimony is. But so. I guess the problem, though, is that you know, many, probably most couples, you know, don't sign prenuptial agreements and don't sign cohabitation agreements. And so if you get couples in at the beginning, which tend to be, you know, maybe some of the clients who are, are better off, uh, you know, you've got a fighting chance of resolving it in some way that's satisfactory to the clients. But the problem is that, of course, most of these cases only show up in a court when something's gone wrong and there are no documents. And, you know, then the court has to decide, you know, what to do with this thing that sort of looks like a marriage, even though there was no official marriage. And, if, and you know, again, this does transcend the whole issue of whether it's a same-sex or an opposite-sex couple. The American Law Institute a few years ago came up with some principles of family dissolution, which really try to approximate these informal unions to marriages. And the idea is that the longer you've been together, the more courts should look at your uh, cohabitation as a marriage for purposes of dividing assets. Uh, could we be going back to common law marriage or something like that? That's an interesting way of looking at it um, because, of course, you know, as you know, states have moved uh, pretty far away from common law including marriage. Including Pennsylvania. Including Pennsylvania, right. So it's, it's not quite the same thing because it doesn't look at it 
uh, as a marriage, you know, sort of intact in the same way common law marriage does. But it does, it does move in the direction of approximating some of the consequences of marriage dissolution. So to that extent, I think you're right. You know, the one thing I was, uh, the, the professor talked about, in Pennsylvania, if you don't have a cohabitation agreement and you're living with someone, then the property passes by title. Mm -hmm. So that means if I put my money into the house, but it's titled in the person I'm living with's name, I could be out in the cold. Right. Mm -hmm. So make sure you, you get to see your, your attorney. You may not want to get married. Okay, you're straight. <laughs> yeah, but right. go and see your attorney first. Folks, we're here every Monday night dispensing legal advice tonight, family law, especially for unmarried couples. If you need more information, go to our website, lawjournaltv.com. Join us on Facebook. Uh, go to the website, get your law on demand. I want to thank my guests for joining us tonight. Yvette Alvarez, who hails from Einhorn Harris in New Jersey. Professor John Colhane with Widener University School of Law. And as always, Donald Spry with King Spry. And so for all of us here at the American Law Journal, thank you for joining us until next Monday night. Case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by King Spry, serving its Pennsylvania clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law for over 30 years. Einhorn Harris, a long-standing community law firm with the largest family law practice in New Jersey. And the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.